So, another large cast, uh, this time to talk about care. Um, so, uh, let's introduce each of you, starting with you. Thank you. My name is uh, Monika Lanzenberger. I'm from the Commission. I'm working in DigiConnect and um, I'm there, head of sector for research uh, in the unit of e-health, well-being and aging. And actually, I think that uh, it's good to have this broader perspective. So the IMI certainly is doing very important work. Uh, but we also do ha have a lot of other activities and it's good to see how they complement each other and where they can benefit from each other. I think uh, for the first round, I leave it with that. Uh, DG Connect, I think an incredibly important part of, of, of adding value to uh, uh, IMI. So repetition is one of the key things for strengthening memory. So my name is Kim Baden Christensen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Brain Plus and we work with digital health solutions to help people increase and maintain their brain health. And uh, I'll keep it short for that reason. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stacy Gamonos. I'm the director of Eurocarers, which is an umbrella organization based in Brussels and trying to convey the voice of informal carers. So essentially families, friends, neighbors, providing usually unpaid care to someone with long lasting um, care needs outside of a professional context. And so we work on the recognition of informal carers, support to informal carers, but also alternative solutions. And obviously ICT-based solutions are a great instrument for that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Harriet van der Roest. I'm a researcher at ZorgDNA. I'm also a member of uh, Interdem. Interdem is a European research network and we are uh, focused on early, timely, and quality psychosocial interventions in dementia for both people with dementia and carers. Uh, we uh, established a task force, Assistive Technology, that's especially aimed to um, increase the uptake and increase the dissemination of uh, assistive technology in dementia. I've been involved in different projects, uh, multidisciplinary projects on development, evaluation, and implementation on technology. And the more I work on this topic, uh, the more I become aware that we need to have different approaches because I'm a strong believer that technology, technology can benefit a lot in care for people with dementia, but also for people with other brain diseases to include them in society and also to empower them uh, by maintaining, uh, managing daily functioning, uh, have meaningful social contacts and uh, meet societal obligations. So I'm looking forward to this discussion and find good solutions. Okay, Peter. Good afternoon. Um, my name's Peter Panisha. I'm a retired, uh, <coughs> excuse me, company director of one, probably one of the best industries in the world. Um, in 2008, I, I married Hillary. And in 2012, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. My interest is in supporting Hillary and the uh, support that other carers should receive, technically and physically. Okay, thank you. Hillary. Thank you. I'm Hilary Doxford, and I was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's in 2012, as Peter just said. Um, my last job, I worked for a research and audit charity in the UK looking at renal disease. And in 2012, when I got the diagnosis, I moved to, from your side of the fence to the other side of the fence, being a patient. And that was a real eye opener to me. I thought, I won't say I thought I knew it all, but I thought I knew what patients wanted. How ignorant was I? I have learned so much. So I co-founded the Three Nations Dementia Working Group. Um, I was a member of the Europe Alzheimer's Europe European Working Group of people with dementia, saw what they achieved, and we needed something like them in the UK. So we set the group up to be run by people with dementia, for people with dementia, with people with dementia, but it's not just about the people with dementia because we want to work with all of you to help you deliver a better end result for people like myself and my friends. 
Okay, let's start with a general question is, you know, there are clearly a lot of things out there, uh, digital brain health, that are really promising. And you know, they're being offered to uh, facilitate the healthcare of people with brain disorders. But how can we enhance their usability and their usefulness and perhaps their acceptance um, by patients and, and carers? I mean, funny enough, Peter, you were mentioning about the you know, one thing about acceptance is that um, mobile phones, smartphones, have screens that are far too small uh, for many patients to see, particularly those who are older, and that tablets are their preferred uh, method? Generally speaking, um, de or dementia or Alzheimer's or any mental disease comes later in life. The supporter and carer usually is the spouse, or the loved one, and they are also of that uh, generation. So therefore, there is failing eyesight, perhaps arthritis in the hands. I am I need to develop technology that is simple, simple to use. It may be complex in the background, but at the front of the shop, it must be very simple. I see technology going in two directions as far as Alzheimer's is concerned. There's the medical side, which is very complex, but there is also the um, apps and facilities for the patient or the carer. What concerns me is that the two will go off in two di different directions and there will be a big chasm in the middle and it will not necessarily be bridgeable. So I think the two must run in parallel but still keeping the front of shop simple. Yes, and that simplicity, as we've heard before, needs to be not just for the, uh, for the user, but actually for doctors to uh, interpret. Kim, you've got any thoughts? Yes, I think uh, speaking from practical experience and trying to develop digital solutions for people with brain disorders, uh, if you're not working constantly with patients themselves, you will never have any idea of what their real needs are and what they're really capable of. And uh, so from starting out thinking that we knew something, we realized that we, we didn't really, we need to sit every week with patients to find out whether the things that we're trying to, to develop, whether they actually work and whether they work for the patients. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do more and more now is also to involve caregivers and family members who are surrounding the patient because it's all part of understanding the daily life of the patient. This. Mariette. It's very important to involve the end user as early as possible in the whole development pro process. And especially if you deal with a degenerative disease like dementia, because it doesn't stay stable, people deteriorate and their skills deteriorate, uh, the ability to learn de deteriorates because there's certainly an ability to learn. But we also need to create more understanding on how people embrace technology and how they learn to use the interface. And a very simple interface might work for a lot of people, but for other people it might be very stigmatizing because they're on a much better level. So if we are developing technology, it's very important that we think how we can tailor the technology to the needs and skills and capabilities of the people who are using it. So, and that you can only reach if you involve your end users from the start of the project until the end with the evaluation and also with implementation and dissemination. Hilary. I'd just like to really echo what you've just said. Um, with dementia being progressive, you can always be too smart with your technology because the more you help us and take over what we're trying to do, the quicker we will de decline because you're not forcing us to use our brains. So in the earliest stages, the technology needs to be there to perhaps um, prompt us rather than telling us to do things. And then as we get find things more difficult, it becomes more of an enabler and, an, and gives us instructions. 
And that needs to be taken into account because you can kill with kindness, you can do too much for us, and you will actually speed up our decline. So I would just echo what you say, be, be mindful of the progression of not just dementia, I guess any disease, but dementia in particular. You need to be very mindful of how changes in brain function are occurring and how you can accommodate those with what you come up with. I would like to address a very short point on that because it's also important that uh, the technology addresses a specific need. So, and the needs also change. Uh, so, one day you can have a need for a social contact, but the other, more further up in the disease, you might have a need for monitoring for safety, for instance. So, interventions should be needs based instead of intervention based statically. Jesse. Yeah, just to reiterate, simplicity, user friendliness, co creation is a key word, not only for patients, but for carers as well who, by the way, provide 80% of long-term care in Europe today, based on your research. And I would probably add the issue of trust. Um, I think it was mentioned before, if you were to go to your you know, app store now and type care, you would probably find thousands of apps. So can you trust all of them? Is the information they provide you know, useful, relevant? And, and there, I think it's, a, it's about connecting informal care and formal care, so professional care, to, to what extent are you able to actually, as a carer, have a discussion with your care professional and, and explain the kind of information you're finding, for example, on your app, and, and get more advice, more information. And, and there, it's also about ch changing the mindset among care professionals, I'd say, to establish that link. Uh, I think I just want to circle back to what Hillary said because I think it's an extremely important distinction to make when we talk about care is whether we're providing solutions that are compensatory, that compensate for the abilities that are slowly being lost and they will definitely not do anything to maintain or strengthen the abilities that are there. They are all fine, they're good, we need them, but at the same time we need to have solutions that will also help people maintain or strengthen in whatever way they can uh, to stay independent, to stay as healthy as they can. And there are plenty of things that can be done, regardless of the fact that you have an incurable disease. Uh, the same things that Im impact normal health will keep people healthier, more functional, regardless of the disease, if you start acting on them. And those are some of the solutions that we should also be focusing on when we talk about care of, a, of a neurodegenerative disorders, for example. Because we're thinking about um, the needs of patients, but actually you were saying the needs of carers are currently very important. And what we see in carers is burnout. We see very, very high stress levels. We see the, you know, the, the mental health of the carer suffering. Are there digital technologies that we can use to reduce the burden for the caregiver? Monica. Maybe um, let me try to directly give some try to, to answer to that. Uh, so if we see uh, that an important part of the work is to monitor basically to be available in case some emergency happens and um, even during the night for example. So we of course know that certain sensors and monitoring systems can help to um, take away some of the burden of this monitoring work to really distinguish when it's essential that someone comes and helps and when it's not so important because everything is fine with the patient and the system is just uh, reporting a normal status. Uh, but let me go back to the discussion that we had earlier. Um, I'm a computer scientist. So for me, um, of course, the user needs are very important. So we had, for example, when I was doing my PhD ages ago, we had a project with doctors um, of anorectic patients. And what tools, what tools can they use, what would be useful for them, and to, to understand whether a hospitalization is more efficient than staying at home and having the treatment at home. So carers, doctors, patients, all of them are users. Now we all agree that the users needs need to be taken into account because otherwise <coughs> the tool is just not useful. Now the question is why it is not done more often. And that's my point now. It's also about economy and efficiency and how much this tool costs. 
So when we do research and we study the needs of one user, individual user, it becomes very expensive, of course. Now the question is how we can turn this into something that can also be used in a health system and is still of value and can be paid by someone. And that's an important step, I think, that has to be done. Because there's a big issue of perception here, isn't there? That sometimes digital technologies are seen as the cheap solution, trying to get away from human-centered care to using a digital technology or you know, robotics or whatever it is that, that means that the human care component can be reduced. And there's understandable suspicion about that. Henriette, how can you see that being resolved? Yeah, I think that every person who's working in, in this type of uh, research and de development should be super aware that care is a human thing. You interact, everybody needs interaction and not with a robot. But technology can be increasingly strong to alleviate the care burden by taking over tasks. But there should also always be the responsibility of a human carer <laughs> over the care of a person who is in need of that. Because that's a basic human need. Because things like um, robot seals, and there's now a robot sloth, um, which is used in a dimension. A robot sloth, I want a robot sloth. Um, but these kind of things that are very comforting and, and, and useful. And yet, although people with advanced dementias really love them, other people see them as being a substitute for care. No, it might not be a substitute for care. It might be an add-on to care mm -hmm. because it gives you... Uh, there, there have been studies, like, for instance, on the robot Paro, that is, uh, relo relieves emotions, that it puts pe people back in their uh, regular emotional state and calms people down. And in that sense, it, it's a very good intervention to use, but it's not a substitute for human care. And, and it helps people, but it doesn't help for all people. It, it, it's tailored. It should be tailored. Hilary. In the absence of a treatment for dementia, quality of life is what it's all about for us now, and for both of us. And um, I was asked once what my view would be on a robot sort of looking after me. How would I react? And I was thinking... At the moment, I would be fine about with it, but maybe in the later stages, if this thing came up to me with a square face and started talking to me, it would probably freak me out because I wouldn't understand what it was all about. I really don't know. But um, on, on the, 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 the carer's side, anything that can be done to reduce the burden of what... This is the thing that saddens me the most, is what I'm going to do to Peter's life because I know he'll sacrifice his quality of life to look after me, and I really don't want that to happen. So anything that you can do technology-wise or any, any other way would be great. And I'll just give you an example. One of our... Um, this is going to sound horrendous, but it is horrendous. One of our neighbours has... Um, his wife has dementia, and I was just speaking to him about the support he was getting, and he said... He's, this is the UK's um, social care at the moment. He said, well, I'm not getting anything... I said, so, well, how are you managing? And what he does, he, this is, sounds awful, but he locks his wife in a room for a couple of hours and he can hear her crying one side of the door whilst he's crying on the other, but he cannot do anything because he needs that break from the 24-7 care he's having to give her. So anything technology can do to help that, um, I'm not sure what it can do, where it can do it, but things like that, we've just got to move away. And the social prescribing... Um, aspect of care using technology, I think is about to open a huge potential to improve the lives and quality of lives of people with dementia. Any thoughts from you in the audience about this? Because it's a really important area. Uh, somebody up on the right there. Yes, th thank you, John Weber um, from Switzerland. Um, we are looking into let's say, um, looking to communication governance because you want to know what the literacy is and what the frailty needs are of uh, the citizen. So citizen-patient is equal. And we are already doing this together with the German Space Agency and the Assist for Health. What is then actually 
taking care of all these um, questions. I'm a little bit surprised that I don't see m much more people here out of the technology side of the business that are just saying like just before on the few other um, panels that this is already existing. It's only that in the technical part, you only see people that are very technical. And here I see only people that said the technology can solve it. And on the technology side, they say, yes, we can do everything, but they never actually did anything in healthcare. So my wish to the IMI is actually um, finding more bridges, as was said before, with the DJ Sanko and the DJ Connect, that they are more aware about this and that they are really looking into that because I see a lot of wasting time and de facto we are not, I didn't hear once European disability card. I didn't hear once uh, the second quantum revolution. One from the one side of the handicapped, what are the needs of patients? That is done by the VODAS 2.0. It's a sustainable development goal in Geneva. So I hope, I'm not saying too much, but these are things that are already existing. And on the other side, the second quantum revolution that should be known from the technical side, who wants to say we are going to make huge algorithms, but we need real life uh, assessments. What actually the HTO, the health technical assessment, would maybe go in that direction. But I miss a lot of people that are jumping from one to the other ecosystem. And IMI, I think you should use more of your research people to sometimes chip chop to other places because it's, it's going to be a crazy world in the second quantum revolution and we will have peer-to-peer -peer data sets that we can use for everything. But I didn't hear about it at all today. So. Okay. Yes, health. Okay, so Monica, so first of all, would you be prepared to have some IMI people seconded into DG Connect? Absolutely. So any day. Um, but actually, um, I think we have different perspectives on that because, in fact, we collaborate very closely. Of course, it's not always the, let's say, it's not always so easy to detect if you see certain documents that they were. Uh, co-authored uh, by different stakeholders and for example in in the research funding that we do in Societal Challenge 1 where we collaborate also with uh, the with other services of the Commission for example the DG research where IMI is very closely linked to um, we have we call usually for proposals where we pay a lot of attention that the different stakeholders are involved and specifically that patients or patient representatives or people who might in future be patients. So it's not only about uh, diagnosed uh, people, but in a way uh, we are all concerned by that. So bringing together these different stakeholders is so essential. And um, of course there are always um, certain terms that people use and then it, they are only understood by certain groups and the other groups feel that they are outside of the scope and they don't listen anymore. I think that's one of uh, the main um, achievements also from IMI to bring together different stakeholders, meaning doctors here for example, with authorities, with public authorities, also with patients and, um, and other users. So while um, I agree that this should be a concern because it's not something that happens just like that. It needs real engagement and effort. And I think it's good to be reminded about that. Okay. Um, is there anybody who d uh, develops digital technology for use by uh, people with uh, dementias in, or in any uh, other care? Anybody here? Um, okay. L let's go to this lady here and just tell us a bit about uh, what you think about this area. So I, <coughs> blue companion, uh, Susanna del Signore. So I think that there is a lot can be done, but uh, the, the point is about uh, the good uh, interface uh, with patients. So a lot of studies should be done in order to use, for example, robots. Robots have a, a, a huge uh, potential, but uh, um, the perception of the person with dementia of the robot has 
um, Hillary said before, is, is, is the most important thing. So there is a lot of preliminary study to be done. And I wonder if industry want to embark in this kind of uh, uh, adventure. But there is a huge potential and there are studies that are starting uh, to work uh, which are the best interfaces uh, to, to, to assist the patient uh, to, or to get the data that can be used in the future to better address uh, the needs uh, in similar cases. So I think uh, there is a lot to do and there is not enough uh, connection between the players. So I think uh, that, that IMI is a wonderful opportunity to start uh, this project. Okay, and there's a lot already done in robotics, of course, in the in the uh, Japan. Um, lady in that row there. Hi, I'm Karin Bonner, Flanders. We are government. We are experimenting with um, the digital, what we call the digital help and support plan for each uh, patient but we don't call him a patient anymore. We call him a person in need of care. And together with all the caregivers, the volunteers, the family, the neighbors, we try to make a tailor-made solution, a 24 hours, if necessary, solution to organize care. So new technologies can be used. Um, caregivers can have... Um, this uh, digital plan, they have authorized access depending on their role. For instance, uh, a family practitioner can bring in this digital plan other um, uh, data than the neighbors. They cannot see uh, the same uh, data. And it is uh, used as a platform so that whenever you go on a holiday, on a weekend trip to the coast, whatever, Every authorized caregiver has access to your tailor-made uh, help and support plan. So it's a technological um, device and it's tailor-made. It means that um, the person in need of care himself decides what type and the amount of care he wants in which, on which days, uh, stage in uh, the developing of the disease. So uh, several um, uh, points are regulated together with uh, mutualities. Uh, this plan is made, it's paid by the government and uh, the situation that somebody is 24 hours the only one to deliver the care and uh, even has no one hour break can be saluted because this plan is tailor made. And I think if we don't start to uh, to make such a plan for every person in need of chronic care because you can have dementia but when you are getting older maybe there are other pathologies coming up uh, it's more than one pathology so it's getting complicated then with this uh, primary base we can build new technologies to understand uh, the caregiver and to understand the person in need of care. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take another, um, there was somebody else who had their hand up. Um, hello, down here. Thank you. The, the, last, uh, the last answer was, was very good. Uh, these things exist. So I recently went to South Korea and I've got this amazing database called K-Dreams, which allows uh, a person with dementia or their caregivers to actually access all the services around their area. And it highlights to them what are the services they're not taking advantage of, which of course would uh, address exactly the problem of Hillary's neighbor. And I have seen it myself with my neighbors in England, and I know the services are available, but people don't know. And this goes back to these issues and how IMI perhaps could help with its scientific uh, base to, yes, create solutions like this database that can be studied and duplicated and analyzed, but also how do you actually get it to the people? That still is the biggest problem. How do you get it down to the individual household with this issue, even when the resources are available. Okay, um, I was just gonna ask you two, uh, Peter, first of all, what digital device do you find the most useful? Um, myself, I use the iPad because um, I have failing eyesight. Uh, smartphone is too small. 
um, how many times have we heard somebody say, I get my six-year-old son or daughter to program the smart TV or the smartphone or my iPad? And if that's a 30-year-old saying that, what's a 70-year-old going to say? So basically what I'm saying is, when somebody is diagnosed with um, dementia or Alzheimer's, there's not one patient, but there's at least two. A point well made. Hilary. Um, I worked in software for 10 years and basically grew up with, with technology from the days of DOS through to where we are now. But I feel that technology is now moving on without me. And it came up this morning, um, and it's about trust. And I am now very, very wary because I feel I'm not on top of technology and how it works anymore. I'm very wary of using it. I do have some friends that use Alexa and they rave with friends with dementia and they absolutely rave about how useful Alexa is to them. I'm wary of using it myself because I heard about this being watched thing. Um, and then there was the WAPS, WAPS app, um, what's app issue the other week. I've forgotten what it was about, but it was another thing that worried me. So as a result, I use the internet, I, and, um, but that's really as far as it goes. I use one app because I do a lot of train travel, and that's the, um, the train line, and it really helps me. Apart from that, until I've got more confidence and trust in the software and the technology that's out there, I am very, very wary about using it. I still have that awareness of risk and I don't want to put myself into, a, I feel, a vulnerable position. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, just taking up on that, it, it does make the patient and carer vulnerable um, to hacking or whatever. So um, there must be safeguards for that as well. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Kim, just one last thought from you. Just one comment on, on the trust issue. I think that just brings up the, the fact that clinicians and authorities still play a very big role in endorse, endorsing the right types of technologies and explaining to patients or potential people who, were, who, who are at risk what type of technologies they should use. So that, that role is still hugely important for the acceptance of the general population. Even though digital technology can reach everybody, it's just to go to the app store and download it, no problem. But the trust needs to be generated, and that has to come from a trusted source. And, and what is a trusted source? It will be your clinician, your doctor, or the authorities. Okay, so um, let's now think, as we have done in every session, of what you would ideally like IMI to do. So Hilary, what's your thing that you'd like IMI to do? I would, um, it's been said again earlier, it's about the patient voice, and I think that if you can engage with patients right at the beginning of any work, it can potentially prevent some overlooked factors later on in a project. And I have one very quick quote here to give you an example of what I'm, the sort of thing I'm referring to. And this is nothing to do with dementia, but it had an impact on people with dementia that wasn't considered when it was implemented. Um, it's from a, a colleague of mine, and she said, I'm still a good reader. I enjoy reading my books. I used to go to the library every week. Now I've stopped using the library because they've introduced self-checkout. I worry what will happen if I get it wrong or I can't keep track of when my books are meant to be returned. They don't stamp the books the, like they used to. So now I no longer go to the library. Now I no longer read. So something as simple as that actually had quite a big impact. And if people with dementia had been consulted with in the early stages of that being implemented in that library, maybe they could have come up with something that would have helped as well. So include the patients as early as possible in your work. OK, Peter. Um, firstly, I like to say, don't forget the back button or the undo button because um, people are liable to make a mistake, and if they can't go back, they're stuck. If I may, I'd like to give you an analogy. Some time ago, I developed a clotted cream ice cream. My aim was not only to make it taste good, but 
primarily, I wanted to use the minimum number of ingredients. And I did, and I took it to a su supermarket who invested thousands on new packaging, new labels for that product. Why? Because it was simple. There you are. Pierre, make it simple. Okay, Henriette. Right, uh, what I would like for IMI to do in the coming period is to give care research a real boost by allocating more money to care research because in the medical field, uh, a lot of money is going to, but for care, there's a relatively small amount of money available for grants. And if you have more money, it becomes more attractive and we can more do more things like uh, including more disciplines within research, more advanced technologies because in medical technology, the technology is far more advanced than it is in care technology. We're still pioneering sometimes, I have the feeling. So that is one thing. And the other thing is that there are effective solutions already there for people in dementia, like the websites you mentioned, and also other tools, but they're very difficult to find. Evidence is difficult, so we need to look for other research designs to prove more evidence-based results, um, and also provide information to people with dementia or other people better. And um, we can only do that to include assistive technology in the vocational training of carers. Okay, thank you. Okay, simple, don't overlook carers. Um, I think ICT offers tremendous opportunity to, to informal carers in terms of care, care coordination, social inclusion, access to peer support, access to information training, recognition of skills, work-life balance. So carers play a central role. They need to be part of the, the picture. So probably a pragmatic uh, recommendation or suggestion. I know or I think you now have a panel of expert patients. What about including a few carers there? Okay, so we've got some kind. Okay, Kim. So besides the points that were already very well made, Bridging this gap between the solution providers that are already there and the very well-established pharmaceutical industry, the healthcare sector, just bringing more of these non-healthcare, uh, who were originally non-healthcare, under the umbrella, under the wing of the IMI and the IMI projects, taking, making an effort to make sure that they're part of the projects. So, uh, give me an example of uh, an organization. So, that's App, app uh, developers, for example, who have never done anything in healthcare but decide they want to make a solution for okay. mental, mental health. Um, so this thing about cross-pollination between the technology side and the healthcare side. Okay. Monica. I think a lot of very interesting data is generated in the projects. And it's so important to bring together this data and make it available to avoid that it's only for some uh, limited audience available to have the research done. So I think accessibility, interoperability of data, uh, this real world data that uh, could come from these projects is really uh, a source for new knowledge and we should be able to make use of it. Of course, respecting all the legal obligations and I think, uh, bringing the patient into the focus of that, into the center. As it's not the data about the patient, it should be the data of the patient. So that means the patient should have a much more active role in relation to his or her data. And that I see the IMI could contribute a lot. Okay, terrific. So uh, thank you very much to our uh, panel. Um, very helpful advice and uh, you always bring us back to the ground here to think about the end user um, and the carer as being an, an important part of solutions. So um, we're now going to break for some tea um, and then we're going to come back and we've got um, two people who are going to bring together some of the thoughts from all of the sessions and try and start to whittle down what it is that IMI should be focusing on. Thank you. <laughs>